Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is part of the awesome stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have John Mustakas with us today. Hello, John. Hey, Frank. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. I am doing awesome on this December 20th, 2023, as we record this, as we head into the ending of 2023. Uh, and John, where are you located at? So I am a professor at Siena College, which is a small private liberal arts college in upstate New York. So about three hours from New York and Boston. Uh, and I've been faculty here for about 11 years. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, let's see, December 20th. Is there snow on the ground yet in upstate New York? Uh, no, we have been cursed with a warm winter. We've had uh, like many places. Yeah, I noticed uh, the, the sadness there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> we had a couple of inches I don't know, a few weeks ago, but it's all melted. So uh -huh. we're in that like, you know, tundra, frigid, but nothing, no snow on the ground. Um, mm -hmm. so. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, and I'm in Phoenix and we don't get snow. Um, or what we do every 30 years or so, there'll be a sprinkling. But um, yep. uh, we are raining today, so we're getting a little moisture today. So yeah, very cool. Nice. And John, what do you like to do for research? Uh, well, I work on a lot of different things, but one of my main uh, projects right now is I'm involved in the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument Survey, so the DESI survey, uh, which is actually running on that telescope there. Very cool. Beautiful. Believe it or not. So this Beautiful. is a... A nice uh, picture of Kitt Peak National Observatory. So this is the four meter male telescope. Uh, and DESI is a, a highly multiplex, multi-fiber instrument on the four meter. And we're carrying out um, just the largest spectroscopic redshift survey ever. Awesome. Very cool. Yep. Very cool. And that is going to bring us to this very lovely APJ supplement article. It is open access. It's the open access era, people. You can go grab a copy for free. Go get one. Sienna Galaxy Atlas 2020. John, take us away. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, at, a, at a high level, this is a galaxy catalog. So uh, we, as astronomers, we use catalogs on all uh, at all levels from stellar catalogs to galaxy catalogs to uh, emission line catalogs, whatnot. Uh, so this focuses on uh, large angular diameter galaxies. Cool. So what that means is galaxies that are uh, either intrinsically large enough or near enough to us that we can they're spatially resolved. So think about you know 10 or 20 arc seconds or larger on the sky. Cool. So it includes many of the famous uh, galaxies that we're all familiar with, like the Messiers, the NGCs, the ICs, UGCs, mm -hmm. uh, and tackles what is historically a, a very old problem of creating a complete as complete a large galaxy catalog as possible and we'll get into all the reasons why this is a really important thing and why these are really important galaxies mm -hmm. cool very good okay so yeah so we'll scroll through here so i can give you some of the um kind of historical context maybe we'll start about here sure. um so uh i think most most of the audience are familiar with the uh charles messier's catalog so the messier catalog mm -hmm. um and of course messier was uh uh, built this catalog because he was a comet hunter. Mm -hmm. And so these fuzzy little blobs on the sky, uh, which included what were called spiral nebulae at the time, were just contaminants, essentially, right? So if you have a, <laughs> you know, an Andromeda and you think you may have discovered a comet, well, let's write it down so that it, we don't keep rediscovering this fuzzy yeah, thing. Non-interesting object. <laughs> right, exactly. So, so the Messier catalog, it includes a mix of both galactic and extra galactic things. Um, but that kind of laid the foundation for um, actually starting to catalog these spiral nebulae 
uh, in a systematic way. So um, it was actually William Herschel. So going on to the next page there. Yep. Uh, and when I was writing this, I realized that I learned that actually his sister, William Herschel's sister, Caroline, yeah. did, uh, who was a, an accomplished astronomer and mathematician herself, yes. did a lot of the grunt work uh, as well, including discovering NGC 205, which is um, Andromeda Galaxy's famous uh, companion. Um, so that water was then carried by William Herschel's son, John Herschel, um, followed by an, uh, some additional catalogs, NGC and IC catalogs by uh, Dreyer. Um, and we use these catalogs even today, right? We, mm -hmm. we have our NGC zip codes and IC zip codes um, for uh, these famous objects. And that's, I think, what is really important about um, this sample cool. um, is that we're, you know, our, where we are in the universe um, doesn't change. We're kind of stuck here. We were born here and stuck here. And so, uh, of course, on the time scale of billions of years, the universe is dynamic. But uh, it, it, sh short of fast forwarding in time on that time scale, uh, these are the neighbors that we have. Nice. Um, and so uh, studying them in detail um, gives us, you know, gives us that window into our universe and also helps us understand, um, you know, our own galaxy to yeah. try to understand, um, you know, why the universe looks like it does, what happened for through cosmic time for things to turn into what they look like today. So studying these nearby galaxies, these large, well-resolved nearby galaxies is a window into our own past cool. uh, and our own cosmic history. Cool. Um, so uh, you know, we can, I think, skip many of the other details uh, here, but, but you know, why, why isn't this a solved problem, right? Since these galaxies yeah. have been known That's for um, hundreds of years, um, why aren't we done, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, Good. Yeah. So uh, so there's a couple of reasons. So the, the first one is that um, that instrumentation has gotten better. Um, so what was used in the beginning was naked eye or small telescope observing. Then in the 50s and 60s, uh, there were photographic plates, which uh, large surveys of Palomar Sky Survey, for example, was carried out uh, both in the north and the south. Um, and uh, and and so as our as our telescopes have gotten bigger, our instruments have become more sensitive. Uh, we've detected fainter and lower surface brightness galaxies. Um, and so, if if you, for example, there's a famous bias um, that um, you know our early picture of spiral galaxies was biased because we were only detecting the high surface brightness galaxies yes. and so galaxies that were very low surface brightness dominated by h1 gas mm -hmm. um like the malin ones for example um uh it's you know eluded um analysis um and uh so if you really want a complete picture of how uh, galaxies assemble their baryons and what how their stars are distributed, how their gas is distributed. You really need to study all kinds of galaxies and galaxy right. types, right? Um, so uh, let's see. So I think towards the bottom of this page here, I motivate you know kind of this need for a new atlas. Mm -hmm. The surveys that. Uh, enabled us to retackle this age-old question uh, is actually a, a, a trio of surveys what, that we call the legacy surveys. Okay. Uh, so uh, we carried out, uh, we used the uh, deck cam instrument uh, at the CTIO four meter telescope in Chile to yeah. carry out a survey in the south. Um, so south yeah. of roughly uh, 30 degrees. Um, declination and below. Yeah. Um, and then in the northern hemisphere, um, we use the uh, the 90 prime instrument at the Bach 2.3 meter telescope at Kitt Peak, which I also used for my thesis work cool. um, to carry a G and R band survey. And then the mosaic camera at the four meter male telescope, that yeah. telescope. Um, to carry out the Z-band survey. So uh, so that was a BAS, MCLS, and DECAL surveys. So jointly, um, 
it gave us about 20,000 square degrees of imaging in GRNC, uh, about um, uh, one to two magnitudes deeper than SDSS imaging. So more more area, more angular, um, solid angle, and uh, and greater depth uh, with with fairly good image quality. Nice. Okay. Now, yeah, I will um, I will mention that. Uh, the motivation for those surveys, these are called the DESI uh, image legacy imaging surveys, was to provide targets for uh, DESI, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument Survey. Uh, so that was the original motivation. Right. Um, and uh, so, but I think that's another interview. Um, so we have the we have this incredible data set. Now I said there were two reasons for studying these large galaxies. So um, you know the first one is they are scientifically powerful because we can resolve their inner structure. We mm -hmm. can look at study them in uh, in uh, you know unprecedented. I think gets overused perhaps in astronomy, but it really is unprecedented <laughs> because is. you can't arbitrarily resolve a uh, you know redshift three um galaxy the way you can you know look into the detailed interior both kinematically dynamically um and structurally uh of a nearby galaxy cool. um yep. so the other reason uh we needed uh to tackle this is large galaxies are um uh, they're kind of bastards uh if you pardon my french um so mm -hmm. they're 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 very challenging to analyze because you resolve that structure in Ooh. detail. Yeah. So you know, if you're interested in some distant little fuzzy blob, uh, it's straightforward to detect its center. You know, integrate up the light. Um, you know, measure its flux, its colors, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but for something where you you have multiple structures, a bulge, a disk, you know, um, isophoto twist bars, warps, all of these, um, or even close companions, right? You might resolve, yeah, yeah. you know, satellites or equal mass mergers, things like that, uh, makes it really challenging to uh, process and to uh, analyze those systems uh, mm -hmm. with a lot of the software that many of us use, you know, for photometry. Yep. So, so that required some some custom care that we we apply in constructing this catalog. So yeah, let's just jump to figure one. Uh, yeah. And I propose we go through the figures and there's lots of technical detail. Uh, so this figure just really shows the amazing eye candy uh, that the SGA provides. Uh, so there are about 400,000 galaxies in the Atlas. Um, roughly limited to an angular diameter of 25 arc seconds yeah. uh, no. out to the 26 magnitude per square arc second isopho. Uh, and so here yeah. I just grabbed uh, literally randomly uh, mm -hmm. 42 galaxies um, and he's they're sorted from by increasing angular diameter. So yeah. Um, yeah. you can see the little white bar in the lower corner of each yes. panel. Yes. Um, so that is one arc minute. And so if you go from the upper left Good. to the lower right, yeah. um, you can see, uh, you know, how the galaxies get increasingly large. Um, and really this mosaic captures yeah. uh, the the diversity yeah. of, of the local galaxy population uh, in terms of color, morphology, uh, uh, local density, um, and interior structure. You know, pick your pick your axis. Pick your <laughs> yeah, pick your favorite. Um, and you know, studying galaxies is really, uh, I think, inspiring. And let me just say that I find it inspiring to step back and actually look at galaxy images often. Yes. And perhaps we don't do that as often mm -hmm. in this era of you know large data sets and you know mega surveys. Yes. Um, but yeah. It's all bits um, and bytes rolling through. <laughs> exactly right. It's it's you know this dimension against that dimension, but um, uh, and frankly, this is what inspired me when I was in high school looking at things like the third reference catalog of large galaxies yeah. of galaxies RC three. Yes. Uh, looking at just yeah yeah ex the vocalers exactly looking at the the just the detail uh, mm -hmm. and and trying to understand 
you know, not only their uh, differences, but also their similarities. Cool. Right. Very beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, so it's likely your fam your favorite objects are in here. Uh, so let's keep going. <laughs> okay. So okay, so how did we? So awesome. we had this twenty thousand square degrees of imaging, which is about half the sky, and about seventy five percent. We can go to figure two, I think, mm -hmm. and about seventy five percent of the extra galactic sky. So if I look at <laughs> you know plus or minus twenty degrees above the galactic plane. Mm -hmm. um, which is where you really need to do this work. Uh, this covers uh, the majority of the of the sky. Okay, so um, so this is actually a, a hard problem. It's one thing to say, okay, well, give me the NGCs, but because that's only a few thousand. But we were at the level of uh, you know four hundred thousand. Um, so uh, what we decided as a team, and I realized I didn't give a shout out to my awesome co-authors. Oh, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that. So uh, uh, this is a fantastic team. Uh, to uh, concentration of of colleagues and collaborators at uh, Noir Lab, NSF's Noir Lab. Nice. Um, uh, so uh, Arjun, Stephanie, Aaron. Um, uh, Frank Valdez and Ben Weaver are all at Noir Lab, um, yes. as well as some collaborators at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, so David Schlegel and Rong Pujou, um, and then Eddie Schlafly is now at Space Telescope, but was at Lawrence Livermore previously. Mm -hmm. um, so just a great team, uh, but yeah. really this uh, the 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 heart and soul of the effort was um by myself and and dustin lang who's at perimeter um yes so a lot of the just the grunt work of of setting up the infrastructure to do do the analysis we've done here um with a, just lots of contributions from everyone listed here so awesome shout out awesome yeah shout out. good Okay. And, and I'll and let me also say all the imaging is public. Uh, we had uh, ten data releases in I think five years. Mm -hmm. um, so um, everything you see here is public. We'll take a peek at that toward we get toward the end. Yeah. Back to Figure Two and our yeah. colors. And there we go. Okay. Good. So um, so what we the what we decided to do was so well we know every we know a lot about uh, large galaxies already so we opted for this first version to start from um, known large galaxies uh -huh. uh, so we use the hyperleta extragalactic database um, okay. as a uh, as our to build up a parent sample um, now which is wonderful on the other hand, um, no database is uh, perfect. Uh, contains, you know, artifacts and and errors and incompletenesses and things like that. Um, we'll talk later about how we're planning to address uh, those issues. But this figure here just highlights some of the objects that are in Hyperleta that claim to be large galaxies. Uh, so, like looking at the upper left. Uh, PGC 95115, mm -hmm. um, the red ellipse there represents um, the center and geometry in Hyperleta. And clearly, there's no object there. No, um, obvious. <laughs> the other, uh, the other, the other three objects in the top row, those are simple asterisms um, that with whatever software was used in the PGC, which was circa 1989, mm -hmm. um, yes. were, were confounded, confused, uh, these two stars or three stars for one large system. Um, then you have examples uh, like the SCSS object. Uh, yes. This is a, a famous uh, failing in the SCSS photometric pipeline. That bright star below actually creates an internal reflection. Uh, and so uh, if you go look at this part of the sky in the SCSS, uh, there's this big, beautiful thing, but it's just a um, scattered light. Um, Anyway, you can you can understand uh, stars, um, bleed trails, uh, yeah. you know, centers. Um, all of these create problems. Um, there are also in the bottom row H two regions, uh, which oh, whose yes. mm -hmm. whose diam and other structures whose diameters um, got con uh, had errors. Mm -hmm. So we did um, 
to clean up as much of the parent sample as possible. We did a ton of visual inspection. Uh, we probably looked at of order 10,000 uh, objects by eye. Um, now that's not to say there aren't still errors, but we, sure. we did our best. Um, okay, so let's uh, move on Very cool. um, to oh, figure just, three. Just ask, what is the issue with identifying here in the last one in the lower right, SDSS 211? <laughs> Yeah, good. So the blue ellipse is the spiral galaxy that's in the SGA. Um, okay. But that star just off center got parsed by SCSS as wow. and either had, had the lar large diameter or I'm not sure the exact provenance. Uh, and so yeah, it, yeah. if we had if yeah. we had kept that, it would have been a duplicate essentially. Yeah. Um, but the SCSS source is incorrect. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Oh, yeah, perfect. good question. Yep. Good. Okay. Projected catalog. <clears throat> and ooh, here we right. go. Right. Okay. So here's so he, this was our parent sample. Um, so uh it's with some relatively soft cuts in hyperlita on diameter. Um, and you know, just some other really basic cuts. Uh, this is the full the full catalog. Um but we don't have imaging over this full area. Um, so if we go to, um, let's see. Oh, no, figure. Let's actually jump to figure five, please. Sure. Sure. Which just shows you the same sky yes. distribution. Yes. And oops, five. Mm, there we go. Oh, my God. Not five. Six, no, seven. This one. Let's go. Seven. It's this one. There we go. Okay, right. So if you if you contrast those two, so uh -huh. this shows the footprint of the final catalog after requiring GRZ imaging from uh, the legacy surveys. Ooh. So it basically shows. So this is an equatorial coordinates. Yep. The black curve is the galactic plane, uh -huh. um, and then you see we have a large chunk of area in the north galactic cap and then in the south um and the south galactic cap so that's about twenty thousand square degrees um and uh and this shows just the surface density of the galaxies in our sample yeah and in this version of it uh you do get some of the the redder colors and some of the um greater density areas where in the previous one i was going why did the color bar go over to red there's no red there <laughs> right yeah so right. maintain this the one. same Right, right. So it yeah. keeps on the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Very okay. Cool. Okay. Um, so good. So if we go to figure uh, four, is that? Yeah. Um, figure four. Yeah. Okay, totals. figure yeah. four. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. Good. So this, uh, this figure shows uh, the, um, yeah. just some of the, shows the relationship between the 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 initial angular diameter so this is uh rc3's very famous d25 so this yes. is the diameter of the galaxy down to the 25th magnitude per square second isophote yes. um and that's the semi major uh di or the major diameter major axis diameter yes. um as a function of just a, a a very rough measure of brightness here. This is the total B band magnitude homogenized by Hyperlita uh, in Vega magnitudes. Yeah. Um, so yeah. these are quantities because these were kind of a hodgepodge, although Hyperlita makes an effort to homogenize everything, um, yes. they're drawn from many sources. So they're not uniformly measured. Um, but that's fine because we will measure them from our newer imaging. Yes. Um, so these are indicative, but it basically shows you the correlation you would expect that larger galaxies are brighter. And it shows the just the the, the dynamic range of um, of uh, sizes and magnitudes that we have in our sample. Um, in the right panel, that shows just a marginalized uh, distribution of angular diameter. Uh, so we, although we started with Hyperlita, uh, we added in a few external catalogs. For example, we wanted to be uh, complete in Milky Way dwarfs. Um, yeah. So we include a, a fairly uh, recent compilation of nearby dwarf galaxies, some of which need special treatment, some of which are so unresolved or so resolved <laughs> into individual stars that they're indistinguishable. Um, okay. So, uh, but so that gives us a tale of systems to smaller diameters. 
Um, the goal ultimately is to join this catalog with our kind of our standard processing. So once something is small enough, uh, then uh, the code we use for photometry is called the tractor developed by Dustin Lang. And mm -hmm. so at some point, the idea is to have a, a fully complete sample of galaxies that uh, in terms of surface brightness, size and uh, magnitude yeah. um, extending all the way from, you know, the the M33s and M31s down to, you know, the, the tail of the luminosity function. Okay. Cool. Um, Great. And so this is the first step. Nice. Okay, we can Nine. go to figure five. Good. Three isophotos, imaging data, mosaics. Yeah, lots of technical tractor, stuff here. Lots of tractor here. Yeah. And okay, good. So, you know, so what do we measure? So, if you zoom out just a little bit, beautiful. Yeah, there we go. Um, so, this shows, uh, summarizes just some of what we measure for each system. So, if we start in the upper left, good. Um, so, that's the image stack. So, that yeah. is the GRZ um, uh, inverse variance co added uh, mosaic. Um, we build a model of everything in the field. So if you do the left center panel, mm -hmm. uh, that is the model. Now that's rendered with the tractor. And you can see how, so for those of you not familiar with the tractor, it's uh, like source extractor, essentially only better. Yes. Um, so you can <laughs> see that all of the resolve structure gets shredded. Um, you know, there's these little blue spirals, you know, the spiral yeah. structure gets, mm -hmm. you know, beat up and shredded wow. into lots and lots of galaxies. So yeah. if you just threw these data into the hopper, which is traditional, um, then this is what you get. Now it is useful because um, it's still useful to do this because um, all the surrounding objects, the stars and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, largely unresolved systems, um, you can subtract those, you can um, you can do mass them, you can do a lot. Right. Um, okay, good. And then the lower left panel just shows uh, the R-band image. Okay. It shows where we've masked out um, uh, both uh, stars. So that white medium-sized circle on the top uh -huh. um, that is based on a, a magnitude uh, radius relation um, and uses Gaia um, cat, Gaia uh, DR2 cool. um, to identify those systems. Okay. Um, and then you see some of the nested ellipses here just showing you know, the onsets here is that these systems are resolved. Um, okay. And so let's uh, not try to fit them with a simple CIRSEC profile or exponential. Yeah. Uh, let's use a non-parametric approach. So right. it uses um, axisymmetric uh, nested ellipses right. using a pretty standard astronomy technique. Mm -hmm. um, and the blue ellipse there shows the uh, inferred diameter at the 26 magnitude yeah. per square second um, uh, isophote. Mm -hmm. So yeah. in the upper right panel, um, that shows the surface brightness profile uh, in GRNC. Um, you know, gets noisy as you hit the sky. Yeah. Um, the center panel shows a G minus R, R minus C. These are in all in observed, so not corrected for extinction or right. um, or K corrected or anything like that. Right. That is yeah. part of future work. So this uh, these are very um, this was very much an astronomer uh, astronomy project. As um, is, as is right. As <laughs> yeah, it's the first step. Um, and then the last panel shows uh, the curve of growth. Oh, so good. this is the yeah. integrated flux um, within a certain radius. Okay. And we developed a, a model um, to uh, actually fit uh, the, these profiles. And so in the lower right legend of that panel, you can see the asymptotic uh, total flux um, yeah. inferred for GRNC. And it's pretty instructive actually to compare those to what you get from either the tractor um, or from other basic you know aperture flux um, integration so okay <laughs> okay good so okay so that's a nice clean isolated system if we go to figure six i'll show you how we handle um systems that are uh grouped together oh yes 
So right. here's here's a, a group. Um, so it's the mm -hmm. PGC 193, 192 group. Yep. So it's got three large, um, um, yeah, large galaxies mm -hmm. uh, with lots of fainter companions, some of which may mm -hmm. be chance projection or not. Um, mm -hmm. That's important to emphasize. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we do build a Angular group catalog. So we don't have redshifts for everything. Uh, so it's not a physical group catalog. We only ask which systems may um, impact one another as yeah. projected on the sky. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's fine. So we developed a method. So um, we still build a model. Uh, mm -hmm. And what we do is we handle each system um, in order of brightness from brightest to faintest. Uh, and so, yeah. so you see the star is masked. Um, there's two stars, right? One, two, good. Yeah. Yeah, one, and, two. Mm -hmm. and then you can see where the first couple of galaxies have been subtract, have been um, processed and then massed out yeah. uh, there. And then the spiral, the edge on spiral. And so this is showing for the third object, um, right uh, how we measure the surface brightness profile. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And if you depend on your screen quality, um, you can see the beautiful shells in the data. Um, so, or the, the, the light and so see yeah. how it's yeah. got yeah, yeah exactly yeah. those concentric shells greens yeah yeah it's very visible right and oh. also in the r band image if you scroll down oh. uh, okay r band image yes yeah oh. you can see there's additional light out there so um oh, so yeah. you know we we uh, -huh. uh so there's there's uh -huh. more to do there's mass there's light out there um and uh but for now we're we're measuring within um yeah, N not as far as we could go in terms of surface brightness level. Um, so same idea here. Um, okay, great. So let's move on to the next figure. It was, here's our curve of growth. <clears throat> yeah. But he's interested there. Seems to work pretty well. These curves here, very good. It's equation one. We oh yeah, good. So here's the 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 full sample. Right. Um, so we've talked about this. Right. Oh, the nice thing if we look at equation two, uh, the nice thing about that curve of growth is you can actually um, analytically solve for the half light radius. Yes. Um, so yeah. in in so far as that model is a good description of the curve of growth then you can read off the half-light radius as based on the extrapolated to infinity total flux. Yes. Um, so all of these quantities are reported um, in the catalog. So okay. down, and then we're going to do yeah. little multivariates. Yeah, so, so um, here we just started looking at some of the properties of the catalog. So taking the full sample, what do we measure? Uh, so from top to bottom, uh, R26 is the uh, semi-major axis at the 26 magnitude per square second isophote. Yes. Uh, so you can see it's similar to the initial distribution, but um, mm. uh, tighter uh, perhaps and more reliable. Yeah. Um, mu sub r comma r26 is the average surface brightness profile in the r band within the 26 magnitude per square second isophone I, I told um, you, but yes i'm with you i know right um so lot, math is a beautiful thing um <laughs> so and of course we measure that in other band passes and to different isophoto levels from yeah. 22 to 26. Mm -hmm. um, phi is the position angle uh, in astronomy speak. Uh, and then epsilon is the, uh, the ellipticity or the B over A, the semi-minor, semi-major okay. axis ratio. Um, so okay. there, there's some, uh, these were just some basic sanity checks um, mm -hmm. showing the, the breadth of the sample. Um, uh, cool. Yeah, good. All right. So then we... Then we started doing some comparisons um, uh, with mm. um, with Hyperlita. So in other words, how did things change um, yes. from our initial input um, based on what's in the database versus what we measured from our catalog? Um, so uh, you can see the coordinates are, you know, 
match uh, in the mean. Um, but there is some, there are outliers, and there were cases, which I'll highlight in just a sec, where we actually measure coordinates for certain systems that were different or better uh, by many arc seconds. Okay. Um, and it's a, interesting to think about some systems um, really haven't been photometered since RC3, so since wow. uh, photographic plates wow. of the 60s and 70s. Wow. Um, I mean, two mass was all sky, but it was fairly shallow. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so um, so at least in the optical, um, and I'll just say a quick editorial comment. It's a, I think it's a travesty um, that we don't have um, deep all sky optical data. Uh, Pan stars, of course, yeah. uh, is all sky, um, but uh, the, the, it is problematic. The point spread function is problematic for galaxies and for galaxy photometry. Right. Um, so, um, okay, good. I don't think need to belabor well, I'll, this. I'll take that but, editorial. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this was basically showing that we largely agree um, yeah. with, with Hyperlita. So. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. So if we go to. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's go down to nine. So, of course, Eight. not <clears throat> good. Yeah. So uh, then we started looking at at completeness of the catalog. Now that's um, challenging uh, because um, we, um, you know, we started ostensibly from something that was uh, complete, <laughs> something that contained the sum of all our knowledge of large systems. Um, but uh, but like again, like most databases, uh, not everything is perfect. Um, so um, okay, good. Words of time. Oh, oh no, I'm sorry. Complete. We'll get to complete. This is one sec. This is a little different. This is focusing on on where we measure coordinates, central coordinates that are um, statistically significantly different than Hyperlita. So right. I don't know. Let's grab a couple. Like the third one in the yeah, top row. Perfect. Pretty, pretty good. Hard. So you can see, you know, maybe you don't begrudge Hyperlita's uh, geometry, uh, but you can see the centroid is uh, what's centered on a mm. foreground star, yeah. uh, whereas, so that's the red ellipse is the yes. incorrect one, yes. versus in the SGA, we peek okay. up on, on the bulge. Right. Um, the low surface minds galaxy to the left also shows another um, mm. common example where we, mm. we, yeah. we nail it. Um, and there's some other, you know, if you scroll down, some other examples that are kind of shocking. Uh, you look at some of these NGCs um, where we, uh, you know, NGC 3521 in the lower right um, is, yeah. uh, That's a famous you know, very famous, uh, 4636. Both of these are in my thesis sample. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, on that scale, that white bar again in the lower left is one arc minute. So... Right. Um, uh, so to, to have shifts of a few arc seconds on the scale of 10, 12 arc minutes isn't significant, but I would still claim that these are so famous that we should really know where their centers are. Uh -huh. Um, so, okay, good. Uh-huh. I agree with that. Okay. Ten, now, not all is rosy. Um, uh -huh. So we uh -huh. compared against uh, the Jared et al. 2019. This is a WXSC. It's the Wise Extra Galactic uh, yes, yes. Um, Extended Source Catalog 100. So these are the 100 largest angular diameter galaxies in uh, Wise, um, which was a very complementary analysis, mm -hmm. um, which... Uh, uh, it does a lot of what we've done here, but in the infrared. Um, so they measure uh, morphology, not just morphology, but surface brightness profiles, centers, ge mean geometry, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think the takeaway here is that for the most part, um, we agree, our geometry agreed. Um, but if you look in the upper left, um, there were a upper left um oh upper left yeah yep there were a few cases where uh, mm -hmm. the coordinates um between what we derived and what was published in um this uh the wise catalog differed when we dug in um they were it was a combination of um genuine differences so 
in other words, defensible differences um, that we attribute to the different effective wavelengths. So WISE, of course, is peering in through the dust, even at, at, at WISE 1, which is three and a half microns, um, and uh, uh, versus in the optical and the GRZ, where dust lanes or other differences in where you would peak up on the brightest center of the galaxy okay. were different, um, as well as a handful of errors. So I flag here a few of the errors in the SGA um, for some of the largest systems uh, mm -hmm. that we will fix in future versions. Um, but so something keep in mind um, for users of the catalog. Not perfect, it's better. Okay, so um, moving on. So that's 11. 12, and then we get into- Good, so then then we yeah. then we looked at completeness. Um, and uh, right. what we did here, um, again, it's, it's not uh, perfect, um, but what we did is we took the Hecate um, uh, uh, catalog. Um, okay. So Hecate um, aims to be a resource for lots of different, um, efforts, but really focused on, um, or one of its focuses is on trying to find electromagnetic counterparts to gravitational wave events. Uh, yeah. uh, so yeah. so f that for to do that game well, you need a, really an all-sky catalog, and you should know the geometry, the centers, and sizes of potential host galaxies for uh, gravitational wave events. Yes. So now there's a, a bit of um, uh, you know correlation uh, because both these catalogs used Hyperlita as their parent catalog. Yes, um, nevertheless, it was a useful exercise. Okay, so what's going on here? So I'm plotting um, the B band magnitude from Hecate mm -hmm. versus the diameter from Hecate, yes. um, and the uh, the red and blue lines show the fraction of matches. Um, and so if you look at the dashed red line at first, okay. now there's lots of small things that are not in the SGA, which is fine because that was on purpose. Um, we intentionally didn't, we had a, a much larger angular diameter cut. Um, well, in fact, Hikata didn't have an angular diameter cut. Um, right. But what you want to see is you want to see that you would like to see this red line, red dash line, asymptote you know, to a hundred, um, but it doesn't. So it actually mm -hmm. declines and it goes mm -hmm. down even to 80% at the largest system. Yeah. So what's, so what's going on? So what we did is we did visual inspection of all of the non matches. Okay. So okay. everything where the blue and the dash line or the purple and the dash line deviate. Um, and it turns out that uh, the vast majority of the things that are in Hecate, large things, but not in the SGA, are spurious. Um, really? They are yeah. wrong diameters or spurious sources, the kinds of things I highlighted early on uh, yes. in the paper. Yes, yes. yes. Um, okay. okay. So something to keep in mind, um, you know, we are, uh, ultimately, my hope is that this, the SGA will feed back into Hyperlita yes. so yes. that, yes. you know, we don't propagate these errors going forward. You just um, it again. Yes, exactly. Um, but in the end, there are, a, a, you can see where the purple line uh, deviates just a little bit from 100% right um, in mm -hmm. a couple of the bins. Yeah, right so, we are missing um, a, about 1% um, of the systems that are in Hecate. Um, it's actually not clear, as we discussed in the paper, how those were dropped. Um, perhaps in the original database query uh, we, we did, um, mm -hmm. there is a, a time lag between when we did the query and when Hecate was developed. Um, so something to keep in mind, the incompleteness we estimate is at the percent level. Okay. So. Okay. Which, which again, we intend to address in the next version. So moving on here, um, and I think we're nearing the end. Yeah, I think 13 is the last, and we have the science apps, and then we got it. Yeah, so lots um, lots of applications, uh, and I we talk about them um, in, this, um, in this section, but let me focus on the next figure here, which you were sneaking up on, um, mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. uh, the, as I mentioned, 
this the imaging was carried out to uh, enable selection of targets for DESI. Um, so DESI is carrying out a spectroscopic redshift survey of over 40 million um, objects from redshift zero out, out to beyond redshift of four. Um, and one of the samples, one of the important samples, the low redshift sample is called the Bright Galaxy Survey. Nice. Um, so think of uh, SCSS main. So SCSS yeah, yeah, main yeah. was flux limited to R of 17.7 um, and uh, Sloan spectroscopy was three arc second um, fiber uh, spectroscopy. So DESI, uh, the equivalent of that is a bright galaxy survey. So this is limited roughly to R of 20. So it's a couple magnitudes deeper than Sloan um, and is uh, um, and we're getting um, optical spec photometry. Cool. Um, so uh, in Sloan, Maine, these large systems, which are, as we've talked about, very important, were they put fibers wherever they could put fibers <laughs> because they were <laughs> photometrically shredded, you know, so yeah. whatever. Um, but what the SGA allowed us to do is to inform target selection. So we've now analyzed this large system. We know where the center is. That's where we're going to put the fiber. Cool. Um, and, and even more, um, because we now know the geometry of the system, there's a secondary program which aims to study the PQ velocity field locally. Uh -huh. And so we've put fibers, for example, along the major axis yes. in order to yes. use the Tully-Fisher relation as, uh, as a direct distance indicator um, to derive the PQ velocity. Yeah. Um, so here I'm highlighting, uh, so the left panel shows the DESI footprint. Um, so DESI is at Kitt Peak, and so we can't go below minus 30. So there's a chunk of sky we'll never reach with uh, at least the Kitt Peak DESI. Um, uh -huh. But that still leaves um, you know a, a very large sample. And this shows that um, the right panel shows the redshift distribution. Um, so in blue are objects with redshifts in Hyperlita, um, but I emphasize here um, mm -hmm. that they're a hodgepodge uh, of sources. Yes. Um, yes. The red histogram shows the number of SGA sources with spectroscopy in the DESI early data release, which nice. was okay. released um, in June of this year, 2023. Mm -hmm. um, and then the uh, final row of the legend shows how many, of the, what fraction of the SGA will have DESI spectroscopy. So uniform, high quality optical spectrophotometry um, by the end of the fifth year. And it's essentially the full sample, uh, very close to the full sample. Um, so really exciting. So take sure. a look at the uh, DESI EDR, just Google DESI EDR. Uh, if you want to start playing around with the data, um, the year one data release will be sometime next year. Okay. Um, so okay. so sure. good. Very good. And let's see, there's one other thing I wanted to bring up. Uh, we'll cover that in a second. But what we do have is how to get this data. Where do we get this data? So let's go ahead and show people where you can get this lovely data. Right, and this is in Appendix B, uh, describes uh, the data access. Um, and so I want to highlight here that we have a, um, a hopefully useful uh, portal um, to both interactively explore the data, to grab the flat files, the merged catalog, um, and uh, do some simple cuts. So if you click on anything you want, any of the links in the group name down below. So if you scroll down. Uh, um, this one. Sure, perfect. <clears throat> Okay, uh -huh. so uh, it just summarizes some of what's in the um, in the FITS files, um, some basic metadata. You can scroll down, shows the mosaics, the model, the residuals, oops. shows our elliptical aperture photometry and curves of growth, um, yep. as well as uh, integrated photometry. So all this is in the catalogs, obviously, cool. but um, if you are looking at one or two or a hundred objects and you wanna do some visual inspection, um, then uh, we do have this interface. You offer that, yeah. Very so. cool. Very cool. And let's go back to the article for one second. 
And that was in, we'll cover that in a minute. And that was in, okay, this is where we have to do the Hyperlead query. And then B was the data products. Yeah, exactly. So, so this was this link right here, the data portal. Do check it out. Okay. Yeah, check it out. Um, you know, you can construct the names just from the name of the system. It shows you right there. Um, the SGA is also available through uh, the um, the data lab at Noir Lab, um, yeah. so uh, which provides a database interface to do um, exploration, uh, as well as uh, you know their joins on SDSS and Gaia and other uh, catalogs. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, if you scroll down, or maybe it's a next appendix. Um, it's C. No, we can skip the tables. That's the data model. All right. Appendix C was down here, known issues. Yeah, exactly. So again, nothing's perfect. Um, these are the issues we, we were aware of when we went to press. Um, it's an entirely open project. All the software is public, uh, all the data are public. Um, and so we've actually had a number of contributions of, you know, questions and issues and incompletenesses um, from uh, from the broader community. Um, so very nice. And yeah. I'm go back to that one. John, I want to thank you so much for walking us through your very awesome APJ supplement article. Thank you so awesome. much. Well, thank you for great questions and for the opportunity sure and uh i mean it was there at the end of the article and we sort of punted around a little bit so now's the time i'm going to ask it um perfect uh and and so where do you think we go from here let's say let's let's give it two time scales let's say over the next two years and let's say over the next five years well don't um, so, don't hold <laughs> don't <laughs> hold, hold me to any it. time no, no, no. yeah come you knocking know, generally generally you know where where do we go with this over the next couple of years and, and we see this this uh really improve so what do you think yeah good so uh so we're actually working on the next version and uh without jinxing the effort um it's uh tentatively the sga 2024 cool. um so so what's what's going on with that one so the idea here is to obviously fix all the underlying issues we are aware of mm -hmm. um but in particular uh what we've been we've been um, folding in some machine learning uh, to uh, improve the completeness of the sample by identifying large systems from the data themselves. Um, so what we want to do is uh, improve the completeness of the sample, especially in low surface brightness and nice. uh, and in areas where Hyperlita, uh, again, may have had um, imaging from old photographic plates, you know, outside of the SCSS uh, footprint, for example. Um, so that's actually proceeding pretty nicely. Um, and so we hope to have a, a more quantitative and complete uh, sample uh, as our parent sample. Um, and uh, we're also going to be folding in Galax and WISE. Um, so WISE yeah. mosaics were released with the SGA 2020, but we didn't deliver surface brightness profiles. Um, but uh, but we have that up and running. And so there will be, um, uh, we'll also add I-band data. So in the end, it'll be um, 10 bands of photometry from the UV to the infrared. Awesome. Um, and uh, and as well as fixing the issues we're aware of, that really sets the stage for um, the, the next version, um, which will be to uh, do physical properties, spectral energy distribution modeling. Uh, at that point, um, we'll have a significant amount of DESI spectroscopy, so homogeneous redshifts. Um, there are there's work on you know flow models, so we would get distances, um, and so um, so I think it's pretty exciting times. Yeah. Um, and I think I alluded to the ultimate ultimate goal, which is to have a you know, a comprehensive um, uh, catalog of galaxies all the way from, again, the Messiers down to the fainted things we can detect uh, in the imaging. Across many bands. Very Across cool. many bands, exactly. It's very, very cool. Well, I yeah. really look forward to seeing the 2024 catalog and getting closer to the ultimate catalog over the next couple Perfect. Of years. Really great to see. Very nice. And it will enable a lot of science. So this is really cool. Yeah, take a look at that last section. Yeah. We discussed just some of it, but it's really, um, you know, a a, a playground um, mm -hmm. that um, 
Yeah, in many different areas of astronomy. Nice. And that will do. John, thank you so much. And that Absolutely. will do everyone. Sure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and that will do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.